Welcome to Conference Highlights, recorded in front of a live audience at an evidence-based perioperative medicine, that's EBPOM conference. EBPOM are world leaders in perioperative education, so why not join us at our next meeting with a special discount for Top Med Talk subscribers. Look us up on www.ebpom, that's E-B-P-O-M, dot com. Top Med Talk. So, pleasure to welcome co-director of this course from the beginning, started as a child, now, Professor Mike Grocott is going to talk to us about exercise and cancer. Mike, welcome. Thank you very much, Monty. It's a pleasure to be here and to have an opportunity to update a little bit on our work around exercise and cancer and surgery and some of the other cancer treatments. Uh, I'll have no significant conflicts to declare in relation to this, a few disclosures, and a huge number of acknowledgements. Principally, the grant from the Royal College of Anesthetists, so the British Oxygen chair of anaesthesia that I was awarded about seven, eight years ago now via the National Institute of Academic Anaesthesia and two NIHR research patient benefit grants, which those two together really kicked off this program. There's a long list of individuals, and I would particularly mention Professor Sandy Jack, so appointed a couple of weeks ago our new professor of prehabilitation medicine, and Mr. Malcolm West, who's a surgeon in our team, who's an academic clinical lecturer and Dr. Lisa Lochney, who's now pursuing her own research programme in Dublin, Ireland. So the aim of this presentation is to present you some new data, and the data relates to these two clinical questions. So I won't go into METS. I suspect METS will come into our panel discussions later in today and tomorrow. But if you accept the large literature that suggests that cardiopulmonary exercise testing is predictive of outcome, and you have a little bit of nervousness about whether neoadjuvant chemotherapy might or might not impact physical fitness, should you be doing the testing to predict outcome and drive various aspects of care before or after the chemotherapy, or, or maybe both? And what is the scale of that impact, or is actually is there no impact? Is the chemotherapy a relatively trivial thing? And then secondly, in relation to patients having surgery, if we accept the premise that your level of physical fitness relates to your outcome, so morbidity and mortality following surgery, is it possible to intervene and, first of all, make people fitter and, secondly, improve those outcomes? And I'm going to present you to the data from a couple of studies that relate to that. The background stems from work that Sandy and I have been doing since about 2008 now, when she first addressed this clinical question around the time the big chemotherapy trials were happening and she was presented in Aintree at that time. She's now moved to Southampton with these patients and was, just had the simple question, should I be testing before or afterwards? And so uh, we tested them before and afterwards. Uh, and in the first cohort, we looked at uh, 39 patients undergoing elective upper GI surgery. And there was a clear demonstration in what essentially was a service evaluation, so some methodological limitations. But there was a clear reduction in anaerobic threshold and VO2 peak Uh, of a magnitude that would lead one to believe that it was likely to be related to outcome. So that was our our first finding published in 2014. We went on and did the same, looking at a different patient group and a different but related therapy, so chemo-radiotherapy, in patients undergoing rectal cancer resection, and showed in that case in every single patient there was a reduction, although of variable magnitude, in their physical fitness measured using cardiopulmonary exercise testing. So... Certainly, there's a change in physical fitness and the possibility in the upper GI group, we only had 39 patients, remember, but in the upper GI group, there was a suggestion of an impact on mortality. So we went on to do what we hoped would be a more definitive study. We got grant funding from NIHR, and I'll show you that in a moment. At at the same time, we were doing, starting to do some early prehabilitation work, and we published this data a couple of years ago now in a non-randomized design, so again, early feasibility work, suggesting that, again, in elective uh, rectal cancer surgery patients, that in the interval that chemotherapy offers, so we'd actually looked at prehab back in the early noughties, so 2002, 3 and at that time the time from referral to surgery was so tight that it didn't feel feasible to do these kind of training interventions. What chemotherapy did was not only potentially improve the surgery by debulking the tumour, but it offered an opportunity to intervene before surgery because there's a recovery period. So between 6 and 14 weeks, is offered by the oncologist as recovery before surgery, which you'd probably argue is an implicit recognition that the chemotherapy might be doing something a little bit mischievous and you need a bit of time off to recover before you have your operation. So this is the first study we did. This is the methods paper published a year or so ago now. So the effect of chemotherapy and chemoradiotherapy. So during the course of this study, the literature went on, and in fact there were four separate major 
trials of chemo and chemo radiotherapy that we picked up patients from on exercise and capacity following upper GI cancer surgery. The hypothesis I've essentially said to you already that the knee adjuvant chemotherapy and indeed chemo radiotherapy would impact thickness and impact mortality at one year. And we had some preliminary data that I've already touched upon that suggested that was true. So it's a multi-center, prospective, blinded observational cohort study, elective upper GI cancer patients, so esophagectomies, gastrectomies, receiving knee adjuvant chemo or chemo radiotherapy uh, prior to surgery. Primary endpoints are firstly the oxygen uptake at lactate threshold or possibly anaerobic threshold that you're more familiar with, and secondly, the mortality one year following surgery. And the secondary endpoints, which I won't present to you today, were post-operative morbidity and patient quality of life. It's surprisingly hard to do some of these exercise studies. So we eventually recruited 159 patients from 384 screened, of whom 100, because this is quite a complex pathway, we, patients fall off the pathway at a number of stages because they don't tolerate chemotherapy, they don't progress to surgery, they get palliation. Some of them miss their exercise tests. So that provided us with a data set of 100 patients who had chemotherapy or chemoradiotherapy and the CPET test before and afterwards and had surgery and we had outcomes at one year, of whom 19 died. So there's a signal there. This is the basic answer to the question, which I guess you've already seen already, but in a prospective blinded study, we still get the same effect. There's a clinically significant reduction in anaerobic threshold and, by the way, VO2 peak following neoadjuvant chemo or chemoradiotherapy. And this is the mortality data for our primary outcomes. So we had to decide a priori whether we thought uh, the before CPET, the after CPET, or the change in CPET variable was most likely to be predictive. And for better or worse, we thought that the change in CPET variable, so those that were most hit by their chemotherapy, would be the most predictive variable. In fact, that turns out not to be the case. So this is not statistically significant. There's a trend towards an increase in mortality, but it's not statistically significant unless you adjust, uh, have a more nuanced approach and adjust for either baseline risk or end-of-surgery risk. However, consistent with the CPET literature as it stands, the baseline CPET test is strongly and statistically significantly predictive of mortality at one year, and the post-CPET test is not unless you adjust for the change, in which case it is. But the strongest signal by a substantial margin is the baseline CPET test, which was not what we expected, but is useful information in terms of understanding how you deal with these patients. So their health will be impacted, but the baseline CPET test is still the most valuable. So these were the conclusions we drew from that. Baseline CPET before neoadjuvant chemotherapy or chemoradotherapy will predict your mortality at one year following surgery. The second study was, if you like, an advanced pilot, so now a proper, still relatively modestly sized, but a proper randomized control trial of a prehabilitation intervention, a structured responsive, by which I mean as time goes by, as patients get fitted, we're continually CPETing them, and so we can calibrate the intensity of exercise to their change in fitness. So if they get a lot fitter, we increase the intensity of exercise. So a structured responsive in-hospital supervised exercise training program. It's a nine-week program. We started at six weeks, but our patients were insistent that they wanted to do more. They were also insistent they wanted to do it together, so everybody trains in a sort of buddy arrangement. And the hypothesis was that this program would affect anaerobic threshold, lactate threshold, so oxygen consumption at lactate threshold, and therefore demonstrate efficacy of training. We were clearly underpowered, we knew it from the start, to demonstrate an improvement in outcomes. So it's a multi-centre parallel group randomised controlled trial. Elective surgery in locally advanced rectal cancer patients, so quite a tight definition which makes recruitment more complicated, but gives you a relatively homogeneous group of patients, therefore your signal to noise potentially is better. Usual care, so no exercise advice unless the surgeon happens to give any, and they don't in general. They started to more now, but they certainly didn't then. Of a nine-week, as I've mentioned, in-hospital structured responsive exercise training program, the primary endpoint, oxygen uptake at lactate threshold, and secondary endpoints, which we weren't really properly powered for, health-related quality of life and activity levels. Modest size study, 38 patients, 30 of whom were male, with a mean age of 64. And this is, if you like, the run-in. So the same data, again, as you've seen for the previous studies. This is the fall in anaerobic threshold that occurs with the neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So this is the run-in to the study. And then they've been randomized at the beginning. Following their chemotherapy, they have an exercise training program. Uh, and you can see that there's a clinically and statistically significant difference between the groups if you train individuals in this situation, they will get more fitter as a result of their in-hospital training program. 
And the reason I say it's as a result of their in-hospital training program is because there was no difference in their physical activity measured using activity monitors, so little watches. So between interventions, they're doing the same amount, but one group is getting onto a bike three times a week for about 40 minutes and doing an interval training intervention, and that materially affects their physical fitness. And one would hope outcome, but we cannot answer that from this study. Uh, the health-related quality of life data, we haven't put any p-values on. They're not statistically different, but there are clear qualitative differences in terms of the patient's health-related quality of life. So conclusion to this study, it is feasible to train patients. Training results in improvement in lactate threshold and probably shifts health-related quality of life, although that's not a statistically significant result. And physical activity levels don't change, certainly during the interoperative period. And as a consequence of this, we're now moving forward to what we hope will be a 1,500 patient study. We're currently only funded for about a third of that. So a region-wide study, randomized control trial, extraordinarily funded by the NHS. So this is through the STPs. They wanted to know if this would work at scale and impact length of stay, costs, patient outcomes. So funded through the NHS, we've kicked off for about 25 patients into this study. It's all major elective intracavity surgery in the non-existent region of Wessex. It's not really existed for about 1,000 years, but everybody down there likes to talk about it. So Dorset, Wiltshire, Hampshire, and the Isle of Wight. And it's a four-arm study with a pure control group, a psychological intervention, a physical intervention, which is the same as the one I've described to you already, and then a fourth arm which combines the psychological and the physical with the hypothesis that actually you may augment the benefit of the physical through improved compliance by having a behavioural modification psychological intervention. So to conclude, we are now convinced, and we've got a number of studies that show that Neadjuvant chemo or chemo radiotherapy prior to surgery does impact physical fitness. From the data we have, it looks like the pre-chemotherapy exercise test is the most useful in terms of predicting outcome. And exercise training is clearly safe, feasible, and efficacious in terms of improving fitness. But the question now, which we hope to try and answer along with others around the world, is whether that will impact patient outcomes. Thank you very much for listening. Nick Majerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out Top Med Talk. Dot com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.